right, today <coughs> what we're going to talk about is taking code that works and make it better. All right? <coughs> code that works doesn't mean it's good code. That's sort of like the minimum baseline requirement is when I say code work, it works, it means it does what it's set out to do. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't mean it's particularly good code. All right? Consider that to be a baseline. Right? That uh, if it doesn't work, it certainly can't be good. Right? But if it works, it might be a C. You know, it might be C code. You know, if you're grading it. Um, what you need to do to elevate it to B or A code is make it good code. Well, we've talked over and over again, and I stress one of the key things with making uh, code better is making it more maintainable. And closely associated with making it more maintainable is to make code um, more reusable. All right? <clears throat> it only makes sense if you have a piece of functionality that needs to be in five places in your website. <clears throat> if you have that code duplicated five times, if something about that process changes, all right, you have to go and repeat your change five times. Well, there's always a chance that you'll forget and only do four of them. And there'll be a bug in your system and, and um, you'll get inconsistent results depending on which one of the five methods uh, calls it. So our goal is to make code that's reusable. That is code that we can take and we can plug in wherever we need to. Much like the, uh, the, the creators of the .NET framework have done, by giving you a framework of controls that you can plug in wherever you need one. All right? You have a validation control all right? that you can plug in for a required field validator. That saves you and everyone else in the world the trouble from having to write code that makes sure that a text box is, is populated or filled in, all right? which is a great thing. Um, the .NET framework is primarily concerned with visual sort of controls like that, and database access. The one layer that it doesn't really address, or the one part of an application that it doesn't really address, is what we could call the business tier, or the business level, business logic. All right? Why? Because there's so many businesses in the world, and each one has their own quirks about how they do something. Right? Um, to, to, go, to, to, to talk about the example that, that you're going over, um, tuition, all right? There's a lot of different ways you can calculate tuition, depending on the particular institution that you're at, all right? Um, here we have a set of rules. Uh, it depends on the number of credit hours and whether you're an in-county resident, an out-of-county resident, or an out-of-state resident. There's a set of rules for that. Other institutions might have similar rules, but there might be little quirks that make it a little bit different. For example, uh, we have in our tuition structure built in that from 13 to 18 credit hours, it's the same rate. So if you take 18 credit hours, you're charged the same amount as if you take 13. All right? So that's a little quirk. Does every institution have that? No. Other institutions, your tuition might depend on the number of credit hours you take, your residency status, and maybe whether you're taking undergrad or graduate classes. So that might be um, an ingredient in the calculation. Some places don't care if you're in, you know, a private school doesn't care if you're in, in state or out of state. All right, there's a simple tuition for everyone, regardless of where they are, you know, because as a private institution, they don't get the tax money from the state, so therefore you don't get a break for living in the state. So the point is, is just looking at that one example, tuition, there's considerable flexibility and, and considerable differences between how different organizations have it. So therefore, it's not the job of the framework to define that. That's something that's special to your business, to your organization, all right? the way you do your business and the way your uh, uh, fees are calculated or shipping costs or whatever. So that's why in your assignment you are to take uh, this and build, uh, you're to take LC's tuition structure
infrastructure and build a, a application that, that can handle that. Now in our examples that we're going to do in class, we're going to do um, simply uh, the uh, Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. That'll be our proxy for any sort of business calculation. To be sure, it's not an earth-shattering calculation, but we can see all the ingredients in place. All right? <clears throat> the whole process of this, by the way, is called refactoring. So the whole process of taking a piece of code that works, but making it better, is the process of refactoring. And I would say that um, refactoring largely includes some of these activities. Making the code more maintainable. <laughs> Making the code reusable. And as we saw, those two sort of go together. Right? If it's reusable, it's going to be more maintainable, more than likely. Making the code more flexible. In other words, instead of handling just certain situations, make code that can handle more situations. That's making the code more flexible. That's one way you can refactor stuff. Make it more fault tolerant. All right. This is a topic that we'll, we'll talk about uh, later on in the semester. But, um, you know, if, what, what happens if someone puts bad data in? Or what happens if there is a problem connecting to the database? All right? A bad program will simply blow up and not give any indication of what happened. A good program will give a very clear idea of what happened and what the user needs to do next. Um, and probably inform the people that are running this site that, hey, your, your system crashed, your, your application crashed, there was, a, there was a bug in it or a problem in it. So that would be a third one. A fourth one, which again, I would put down on the list, or let me, let me put it this way, further down on the list than you might expect, is to make it more efficient. Um, <clears throat> the reason for this is a lot of these other things sort of trump efficiency. All right? So yeah, you, you obviously don't want your code to be inefficient. But, if you spend a lot of time working on the efficiency at the expense of these things, it's probably not a good idea. Now, there are exceptions. Some processes, um, it's critical to have quick speed, you know, and, and to get those. So, so for certain processes, yeah, efficiency is important, all right? But for most standard sort of business calculations, calculating the shipping charge in, you know, in, in your organization, Efficiency probably isn't the top priority. All right, it's important, but I think those other items trump it. Again, you certainly don't want to write inefficient code, but to do like people did in the old days when hardware resources like memory and CPU time and disk space were so scarce, all right, uh, doing stuff in the name of efficiency um, is, is, is less rationalized now than it was in the past. You know, the classic example of that is the Y2K issue. To make it more efficient and make it quicker to store and easier to store, they chopped off two digits in the numbers. And as we know, that came back to bite us later as in the year 2000, Western civilization crashed. All right. Well, no, it didn't actually. All right. But we thought it might, right? And there were a considerable amount of, of person hours devoted to addressing that issue. Uh, the organization I was working for at the time had one person out of a staff of, I'm trying to think how many developers we had, one person out of a staff of four or five, so that would be like say 20% of their, of their labor cost, devoted to addressing that issue. Um, a lot of folks had said that was one thing that was responsible for sort of the, the issues in uh, the drop in the job market in the, uh, uh, in the early 2000s. As a lot of organizations' money was tied up fixing the Y2K bug, and therefore they couldn't encounter new projects and whatever because they were forking over a lot of money to, to address that. So new stuff had to, had to go by the wayside for a little while. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk about refactoring.
The one thing that we talked about last time that we're going to build on this time is the notion of the coupling between the user interface and the business logic. And I'm going to speak about this. When I talk about the user interface, I mean the page with all its controls. When I talk about the business logic, I mean the code to do some sort of business calculation. In our case, it will be the Fahrenheit to centigrade. In your case, it will be the tuition. All right. Each of these should not know much about the internals of the other. All right. So this is a coupling. If it's strongly coupling, coupled, then this business logic knows everything about that page. It knows what text boxes are on it, it knows what radio buttons are on it, it knows what labels are on it, and so on. Strongly coupled means not very reusable, right? Because if it's strongly coupled, then that business logic depends on certain values being in certain places, certain text boxes. Well, what if, there, what if you're, you try to use this code on a page that doesn't have those text boxes? Code won't work. All right? The code is written to know exactly what's on the page and use the material that's on the page and then put the results somewhere on the page. So whenever the business logic knows details about what else is going on on the page or whether the page knows details about what's going on inside the business logic, that's said to be strongly or tightly coupled. And we don't want that. We want things to be loosely coupled. What loosely coupled means is they don't know much about what's going on in each other. And they only communicate in a very specialized way. They com communicate through functions. They communicate through arguments and return values. So the only thing that this page is going to do is it's going to send this function some arguments. The function is going to return a return value. That's the only way those two things communicate. All right? And that's what we're going to move to, and that will be weakly coupled. That will allow this code to be reused. All right? Um, Obviously, there has to be some code that knows about what's on the page, right? Because really, if we had this, the real diagram would look like this. We have the code behind file, which has a bunch of event handlers in it. It's very tightly coupled with the page. That's okay, right? Because we're not going to ever use this code behind file with another page. Where all of those two go together. So the fact that this code behind file knows about what's on the page is just all right. That's okay. So the code in here, it's okay to know what's on the page. But when the code behind file talks to the business logic, that ought to be separate, and the business logic ought not to know. We're not interested in reusing this code. We're interested in reusing that code. So therefore, this is the code we're going to strive to make um, reusable in a black box, weakly coupled, however you want to put it. Let's look at the example we, we had last time and then see where it falls short now. All right? and talk about what we're going to do to fix that. One note, by the way, normally in this class you get an extra half hour bonus lab. In other words, we start at 
11.30, we're scheduled to start at, at, one, at 12, rather, and normally we go from 11.30 to, to 12.50, so you get an extra half hour of lab, because your lab should go from uh, 12 to 12.50. Today, uh, I will be leaving, uh, you won't get that extra half hour, so I will be leaving at like 12.20 today, all right? So it, you get the normal length lab, and, and the fact that you normally get a bonus, I think, more than makes up for that. <clears throat> All right, let's go and pull up the example from last time. And let's take a look and, and make sure we understand what I was saying by looking at this example. Right now, if we were to look at this code, all the code lives on the button click event. All right, all the code lives on the button click event. All right, what's wrong with that? Well, this code could not be reused anywhere else. All right, we couldn't even have on this page, on the page that's already on. We couldn't put another text box, all right, a second text box and calculate two temperatures without rewriting that code, right? We'd have to rewrite that code again if we added, say, another text box. Why would we have to rewrite the code? Because if you look at the code, the code is looking for the data in that specific text box. So if we were to add a second text box, we're going to have to duplicate this code, all right, to grab the data from the second text box, do the calculation, and display the results in a second label. So again, not really uh, a, a good approach to do it this way. Everything is tangled up in the event handler. So this is an example of probably as tightly coupled as it could be, all right, because this code interacts directly with the controls on the web page in our business logic, all right? And therefore, um, there's no way we could reuse this code, even on this very page, all right? And that's, that's a problem, right? That's a problem that, that um, you, know, we, uh, you know, we should address, all right? So, how are we going to address that? We're going to address it in two steps, all right? We have the code now that's very tightly coupled. The code only works on this one page for these particular text boxes and labels. We're going to change the code so that there's a function on the page, all right? So that we can put another text box on the page and at least reuse the code within the page, all right? Um, then we'll go in and we'll separate out the code into its own custom business class. And then we'll be able to reuse that code on any page that we want to use. So we're going to do it in two steps. We're going to loosen that tight coupling in two steps. First thing we're going to do is we're going to separate the code, the business code, the calculation of the Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. We're going to separate that out from 
the, uh, uh, the, 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 the code that knows about the stuff on the page. That is the event handler. All right? And we'll make it into a black box so that we can get the data from anywhere and we can put the results anywhere. Now, for this example, I'm going to get rid of this image business just to sort of streamline it. So let's get rid of that. So let's make sure that this still works. So if I put in sixty eight, do the conversion. 68 Fahrenheit is 20 degrees Fahrenheit, or is 20 degrees centigrade. All right, so we remove that image stuff. Now again, let's imagine for a second, we won't actually do this, but let's imagine if we were to add a second text box to this page. What would we do? Well, we'd have to duplicate this code. All right, we'd have to... After we calculated the first number, we'd have to grab the value from the second text box, put it in a variable, look to see what conversion is going to be done, do the calculation, and then put the results in a second table. So essentially, we'd have that code duplicated again, the code that I've highlighted, and maybe even a little bit more. All right. If we were going to do it for three temperatures, we would have to have that co a code duplicated twice, so it would exist three times. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to separate this out into its own function. And that function is going to accept arguments. And arguments, another way to put arguments, are parameters. All right? They tell the function what to do its calculation on. What do you suppose the arguments for this conversion function is going to be? Uh, and and what, what is in the text box entry? A number. A number. And what does that number represent? A temperature. A temperature. Okay. Now, the reason that I was um, asking those questions is, should the business logic care if the number came from a text box or not? No. The number could come from somewhere else, right? Where else could the number come from other than a text box? Could have a drop down where you pick the temperature from a drop-down, and it converted it. In fact, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, after we write our function, we'll make it so that we put it in, um, get the value from a drop-down. Could come from a database, right? Could come from any number of places. So the argument to the function shouldn't be, have anything to do with the source of the data. It's the data that we want to process. And in this case, the data we want to process, we want to process a temperature. Wherever we get that temperature, whether it be a random number generator, or it be keyed in, or we have a loop that runs through that makes a chart that converts from 0 degrees to 100 degrees, or whatever, we want to convert a temperature. What else do we need to do? What else do we need to know to do this conversion? Yeah, well, we're going to need to know the math, all right? But I'm talking about as far as parameters that we're going to pass to the function, we need to know which conversion you want to do, all right? In other words, do you want to do Fahrenheit to centigrade or centigrade to Fahrenheit, all right? So, that's the two things that this function needs to do its job, all right? You know, if I said convert 58, you'd say convert what? 58 from what to what? Fahrenheit to centigrade, centigrade to Fahrenheit. All right? If I told you convert 212 Fahrenheit to centigrade, that's all you would need to know to do the job. Right? And you'd have to know, as you said, the math. The math, though, is going to be built inside the function. 
as far as interfacing to the function and passing the values to it, all we have to pass is the temperature we want to convert and the kind of conversion that we want to give. What is a function going to return? In addition to arguments to a function, there are return values to a function. And return values represent the answer. All right? What uh, are we going to return? Number. Yeah, a number, the converted temperature. All right? Are we going to return? You said we're going to return a number. Let's play the devil's advocate a little bit here. If you notice, The output to that label is actually a string that says 32 Fahrenheit is 0 degrees centigrade. Are we going to return, in that case, the 0, or are we going to return that phrase, 32 <coughs> Fahrenheit is 0 centigrade? I'd let the page take care of the string. Exactly. This guy's job, again, I, people tend to personify computer programs, all right? But this function's job is simply to give the answer, the temperature. We could choose to display that temperature a lot of different ways. We could choose to construct a phrase like we did here, or we might just display zero degrees, and that's it. So the user interface takes care of formatting the result. All right. So we have two roles here. We have our event code, which is connected to the user interface. Its job is to get the arguments for the function, call the function, and then do something with the results. The function's job is to take the arguments, do, the, do its thing, do its calculations, and then return back the answer. All right? In other words, if we were to return this whole string, all right, the page could never, without some difficulty, display the temperature any other way but this. All right. If we simply return a number, then, the, temp then, then uh, the page can return uh, and display the temperature any way that it wants to. All right. So let's go about breaking this down into a function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and grab this code. I'm going to create a function. So I'm going to say function. I'll make the name of the function convert temperature. I have to specify the, the parameters, the arguments that I want to pass into it. By convention, I usually give um, the name of, of arg. I put the name arg in front of the argument. So I will say arg temp. Because uh, VB.net is a strongly typed language, we have to not only declare the argument, but we have to declare the type of the argument. So arg temp is going to be a double. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to get the, the type. And that's going to be a string. Now, the other thing that we have to define is we have to identify or define what this function is going to return. Now, a function can take many arguments, but a function can only return one value. Now, it can return a compl complicated value. It can return an object that has a bunch of different properties to it, but whatever it returns, it can only return one of them. All right? So in this case, what do I want to return? I want to return a number. So I'm going to say as double. All right. This is what's known as the signature of the function. It's what really defines what the function is. The name of the function, 